Hello and welcome. In this video, we'll be going over the MyCritic firewall, the basic overview of it, how some of the connection states work, as well as how a basic firewall rule works on a MyCritic device. So let's get into the video. Oh, firewall. So this is something that scares a lot of people, but I want to let you know, firewalls are not scary. They're there to help you. They're your friend. They're there to protect you. So in an earlier lecture, when we did the default configuration of a MicroTik device, then you saw with the default configuration, a MicroTik comes with some very basic firewall rules and functionality. We've also set up some very basic stuff in the firewall, like a masquerade rule just for internet breakout. But now we'll be diving in a bit deeper into the MicroTik firewall and how we can actually set up some rules on it ourselves. So firstly, what I want you to do is we'll go into the IP and we'll go into the firewall tab. So in this menu, this actually opens up the firewall menu for all of the different types of things that you can access on the Microtech firewall. You get stuff like filter rules, NAT rules, mangle rules, the raw table, service ports. So these are just ports on the Microtech when accessing certain things, uh, connections, and this we're going to discuss now, address lists and layer seven protocols. The biggest thing that I want to bring up now is this connections tab. This is very important for the Microtik firewall, and this is very important for any services that you might use with the firewall. Connection tracking, if you click on this, this is enabled on auto by default. If you put it on auto, what it means is it will not use the firewall until you add any type of firewall rule. So the moment you add a NAT rule, then we'll start use connection tracking, and then the Microtik firewall will kick into place. It needs to be on auto or yes, if you plan on using any of the firewall functionality. If you put it on no, then the router becomes just a router. It will just forward packets and whatnot, but you won't be able to use the firewall to its full potential. Any mangle rules that you have, any NAT rules, any of that stuff, it won't work. It will just fail. So something to take note of, but not to worry. It is typically just on auto. Um, or it is on yes. So just take note of that. There are some settings in here, but we're not going to change any of these settings. Um, related to the firewall, we'll leave everything as default. So let's just apply or let me set it to yes and apply. So we know connection tracking is enabled. But what is connection tracking? Well, as you can see, there's a whole table here telling us what is happening on the firewall level of the marketing, what connections are being made on the marketing or being established. So you see there's there's these SACs and these are again, just like route flags. If you remember an earlier le uh, lesson, so you can just hover over this and you can see what is actually happening. But in theory, it just tells us what on our network is connecting to where on the internet and which protocols are being used and how long the session has been either established and you get different types of states. So we'll go over some of the states in a bit, but it's just telling you, is there a connection and how many uh, bytes or kilobits or megabits or whatever of traffic has actually gone over the connection. And there's, I, I'm a single computer. There's only one computer connected to this market at the moment, my home computer. Um, and I'm really not doing much. I'm making this YouTube video. And as you can see, there is a ton of connections out uh, to the internet that is keeping track of. So if I'm one computer and I'm doing 68 um, different connections, uh, without really doing much. Think about how crazy it is the moment you start adding a hundred users, a thousand users, tens of thousand users. And that's why it's also important. The more you start doing in an ISP world, if, if you've got a core router where you're running ISP services through and you've got multiples of users connecting through this router, you need to make sure that it's a properly uh, spec router, that it's big enough to support all of these connections. Because if, if it's not, and you hit this max entry uh, on the, uh, connection tracking, then you're going to start having some problems. Users aren't going to be happy. The connections are going to start failing. So just something to take note of. But that is connection tracking summed up. And then I just want us to go into this, uh, the states quickly. So we get stuff like called the TCP states. And by default, you'll see they might be established. Um, what I might do is I'll just quickly bring up an article from Microtix site. So let's just go on to the Google and say, Microtik uh, firewall states. And this is actually a great place because I always recommend going to the wiki or going to uh, help the Microtik so it can show you actually what's going on. But if we scroll down here, this is actually showing you everything about the firewall. But what we are really interested in is connection states. So let's just scroll down or maybe up. It should be at the C connection state. So there are the different types of states that a connection might be in whenever it gets into that um, connection table. And established, it's just basically whenever the connection is made between 
your host that's sitting behind the router or even the router itself itself to a remote side that if it's established there's already a connection so traffic can flow two ways so you get all these different things like invalid new related untracked um, default even though we don't see the default here and you can read all about it here so i will put a link in the description for this article so you can scroll down here yourself but in essence, established packets are what we want to see. Invalid packets means there's something bad happening. New packets is when we're just starting to establish the connection. Related packets means that something is part of an existing connection. So this might be, if you think about if you're doing an FTP connection, but that FTP connection also maybe has something else to just make sure the connection is there, like the ICMP. Um, there's two types of connections happening, but it's, it's not really like the same established connection. So one is a string for the ICMP, whereas the other is the FTP. And then we've got untracked uh, states. And you can also manually set the states on the firewall, but for the most part, you won't be fiddling around with states much, but there is cool things that you can do by using states on the Microtech firewall. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, let's actually go into the filter rules. So filter rules are the, in essence, the firewall rules that you can add on the Microtech device. And I've gone over this before in another video, like how the firewall actually works and operates, but we'll go over it again here and I might use paint. So let me just quickly open up paint uh, let me just make a new document quickly and let's just quickly discuss Microtech firewall principles. So if I'm on the filter rules and I click on this plus, you get different types of chains. And this is something that we need to go over. So the forward chain, the input chain and the output chain. So each of these chains represent a way that traffic is either flowing to, out of or over the Microtech. So I'm just quickly going to paint a little picture using paint and I'm just going to add a little Microtech router here. So let's say that's my home router. And let's just give it some lines. So it kind of looks like a router. And then from my home router, there's a cable connecting to my computer. And presto, <laughs> there's my computer. But my home router is obviously connecting to some other routers as well, which we can't see because everything's just kind of, this is how the internet operates bunch of routers connecting to each other. But there's some some router as well over the internet somewhere. And then over this internet router, there's also like, let's say a cable connecting to maybe some servers. So there's some servers connecting to that router on the remote side. So let's just quickly discuss the different types of chains we get. So I said we get something we call a forward chain. That's the first thing if we look at our chains, there's forward. And when you think about a forward chain, I want you to think about the router actually forwarding packets, things that's going through the router. So let's say uh, this server here, this was, let's just see, is the size big enough? Let's say this was a, a web server, so that's www. Sorry, my paint skills aren't that good, but that's www. And this is my PC. So my PC wants to connect to that web server over www. So what it would in essence do it, it would connect to this router, my home router. So it would send packets there, it would say, hello router, I'm trying to get to this web server. It would look at its IP headers and it would say, okay, cool. I can see if we wanna get there, I need to forward traffic out to this gateway. I need to forward it to that destination. So the key word again is forward, um, FWD, let's just make it that. So we are forwarding traffic. So if we are forwarding traffic, that means the router is passing the traffic off somewhere else. And it doesn't need to be traffic that's going in or out to go to a server somewhere. It applies as well to maybe things that's going out from other servers back to your router. And maybe you've got some NAT rules and you're forwarding stuff to your own internal servers. That's also forwarding traffic. So we can then in essence manage access based on traffic being forwarded. So that is what the forward chain does. So what we could in essence do is, I know my computer's address is 192.168.0.254, that's my PC's address. And then what I could do is, um, let's just open up the command prompt. So let's see, can I ping 8.8.8.8? .8 I can currently ping that, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a forward chain I'm going to set that as the destination is 8.8.8.8. .8 .8. So see, I can manage my source address, my destination address. I can even set the protocol 
And if I click on there, there's even ICMP. So I can just set that for ICMP for pinging. And we can specify stuff like in and out interfaces, uh, different stuff like packet marks, but this will go over when we discuss something called mangle rules. And here we get those connection types we were talking about earlier. So you can set, um, oh, there's the connection state. So you can set it to invalid, established, related, new or untracked. But I'm just going to leave that blank for this example. So I'm going to say anything from my computer wanting to go to Google's DNS server, that's a ping, then we can specify an action. So if I click on action, this is what the firewall needs to do as soon as anything matches these details. So anything that matches these general details, and I can go to advanced as well. There's some more stuff that you can put in here, like address lists and whatnot, but we can specify an action and that action can either be accept, add it to an address list, drop it, fast track the connection, which we'll discuss at the very end of this uh, video series of the firewall. Uh, we can jump, log, pass through, reject, return, target. And what I want to do is I just want to drop the traffic. So what's going to happen now is I'm saying anything from my computer going to Google, that's ICMP. So anything that I ping to Google, I want to drop. If I apply that, you can see it creates this firewall entry in my rules. And I can see no packets have been dropped yet. But what happens if I try and ping Google now? If I do a ping 8.8.8.8, .8 oh no, now it's failing. And if you notice on my MicroTig, it's actually being referenced by the firewall. The firewall is able to see, hey, there are packets trying to be forwarded. This is how many bytes we were trying to forward. These are the amount of packets. And now we know that the firewall rule is actually working. So now we've blocked traffic from being forwarded. So forward traffic, in essence, protects you take a guess, it protects these people, it protects the hosts, protects the, the remote side and also my my computer. So anything that's behind or across the network, that's what you're protecting with forward rules. So that will allow you to, um, let's say, manage traffic for those type of people. Now I'm going to disable that so that my pings can work again. So I can see I can ping 8.8.8.8 again, and that's great. Next, let's hit another plus. And let's look at another chain. So let's discuss the input chain. So input chain, if I go back to my little paint drawing, input, I'm just gonna use a different color. Let's maybe use green. And let's just make it in. And as, exactly as it sounds, this is traffic coming in to your router. So your router is the destination. Your router is where the traffic tries to go to. So this might be traffic from uh, it could even come from a different host from the outside, but they are trying to get to the router. The router is their destination. They're trying to get to the router, the router's IP address or, or something in that effect. They want to connect to the router itself. So um, what we could do is we could restrict management traffic with input rules so that, um, it, and not even management traffic, it's, it's a wide array of things that you can obviously add. But what, what I could do is I could again add the 192.168.0.254, which is my PC, and 0 0.1 is the router. So if I ping 192.168.0.1, I can ping that. So I'm going to make that the destination, which is the router's address. And what I could do is I could also set it for ICMP and I might just drop this again and let's just quickly see if this works. So let me go back, do the ping. Now my PC can't ping the MicroTik, which is uh, good for some reason and it's also bad for other reasons because now I can't actually verify if the host is up or not. So let's just revert the protocol being ICMP being dropped, but let's maybe set it for something else. So let's set it for TCP, which is a well-known protocol that we use. And let's change or set the destination port to some type of management port. So let's set it to port 23, which is Telnet. So if I open up my PuTTY and I go Telnet and I Telnet to my MicroTix IP 192.168.0.1, I hit open, I can Telnet to my MicroTix. Hang on, <laughs> connection refused. Um, I think I might have set something in my services. Let's just quickly check there. Oh, I changed the service to 2323. All right, that's fine. Let's just update that destination port to 2323. Sorry, that was from a previous lecture. And let's try and tell it again. 2168, uh, 0.1, 2323. All right, there we go. Sorry, I just uh, had the wrong uh, service being used. So let's make it admin and blank. So now we know this is actually working. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set an input rule for my source as my computer, the destination being the router, protocol being TCP, the port being the 2323, which is the telnet port I put in, and the action will be dropped. So let's just enable that. And then what I'd like to do is open up a new PuTTY session. And let's connect to 192.168.0.1 on port 2323 on Telnet. And now I should get the connection refused as well. Actually, I might not even get anything. I just need to go to my um, firewall rules and then we can see the packets are being captured and they are being dropped or enforced now. So now we've actually set that nobody from that range can tell net in. And again, you could also maybe do something like we could remove the source address and we could do it in an in interface. So we could put it on our WAN interface. So that would mean that nobody from our WAN, from our internet side could tell net onto this router, which just adds a lot of security to the device. So this is why we would use an input chain. All right, now I want us to go over the firewall chain. So let's go into IP firewall again. Let me disable this old rule. And now what I want you to look at is if we go back to our paint diagram, we're going to get out traffic and I might make this a nice blue color. So out is short for the output chain. So if I go to my firewall, I create a new rule. You'll see there's a chain for output. And all that output does is output allows you to specify what traffic can leave from the router. So the router itself is the source. The router will be initiating the connections and it might be going to something. So you can tell the router where it can and cannot go to, which is quite nice because there might be some things that you don't want the router to be able to do. Maybe you don't want the router to broadcast stuff um, on OSPF, or maybe you don't want the router to be able to uh, connect to some weird sites. And th this is how you could effectively do that, is you could add an IP firewall rule and just set it for the output chain and then we could we, we don't even need to specify a source address here. We can just set the destination address. And I'm going to use Google's DNS server again just to show you how it works. So now we've got an output chain going to Google's DNS server, and I'm going to set the action to drop. And then I just want to open up a window before we implement this. So I'm going to ping 8.8.8.8. .8 so there I can see the router can ping Google's DNS. But if I apply this rule now, can I ping 8.8.8.8? .8 no. And I even get a message back from the router saying the packet is being rejected. And if we look at our firewall rules, we can see packets are hitting the firewall rule and it is being picked up. Great. So that basically covers the different chains that you get. You get your forward, you get your input and your output chain and how action reflects against them. We're going to end off the video here. So I hope you enjoyed it and I'll catch you in the next video where we'll be doing some more cool firewall stuff.